So, peace. I'm really glad to see all of you on Samika, and I'm really excited to see the presentation that our grad students have, and I just want to give thanks to Samika for organizing this. So, today. The agenda is we're just going to um, hear the presentation from um, our two sisters over here, and then we have a keep a line who is um, a native affiliate and a youngster who's kind of had some direct contact uh, with police, his family, friends, etc., regarding stock and risk and the um, curfew. So we're going to hear from him, from him, and following that, we're just going to have an exchange, you know, opportunity to ask questions about the presentation or keep a line's experience, and then from there, possibly break up to small groups and figure out what is our next step. Is, you know, the curfew the issue, or there's some underlying issues where they want to put our power, our voice, etc. So, um, without further ado, allow me to introduce you to Vanessa Massaro and Emma Gulus Gulas? 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 I'm trying to break it phonetically, but one of uh, grad students at Penn working on their PhDs <coughs> in geography and women's studies. And so, they can have more about this. So, thanks so much. Thank you all for having us. Um, it's a real honor to be part of these discussions, and we're really interested in the uh, dialogue. So, technically, like we've got slides, and there's some compelling pictures and quotes. But after we're done, it's driven by questions that we offer to you and can't wait to hear what you think. Um, so I'm Emma and Vanessa and I have been working on issues of the flash mobs and regulation of space for a while, which feels very important to us um, as students, but often more importantly as actors um, in space. And just so um, UPenn doesn't get concerned, we're from Penn State. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about that. Okay. Take credit for I believe you guys <laughs> Thanks again for having us. Yeah, so we'll just kind of walk you through this parts of this paper that we wrote and then, like Emma said, open up the floor for questions. So, um, Like many of you, we've been following the ongoing youth flash mob gatherings in Center and University City and the state responses to them. The gatherings have become even more resonant since the Arab Spring, the London riots, and most recently this Occupy movement. Certainly, the extreme reactions, which we will outline for those of you that aren't familiar, indicate there is something worth paying attention for anyone interested in their right to occupy public spaces. As we track the coverage of these gatherings, we couldn't help but notice the language being used. The concept of a terrorizing flash mob is carefully appropriated by elites, and these kids are represented through this particular imaginary. The carefully constructed, unruly flash mob is embedded in a geography of securitization and a history of repression. In order to consider these youth, it is necessary to put them in the context of the U.S. city and its race and class tensions. So we're going to read through an argument about the city's control of space based on the recent history of the flash mob gatherings and the current extension of the city's curfew laws. We think it is necessary to consider what young people trying to occupy space, be it to organize, to protest, to walk down the street, or whatever, are up against, and we think understanding urban fortressing is a vital part of this. So Emma is going to briefly contextualize what we mean as the representation of the flash mobs by city officials. Then I'm going to explain the geography of fortressing and securitization that we see as undergirding the city's reactions to these youth. And then Emma will go through how the discourse of the flash mob is used to secure and reinforce the city spaces that you and others are trying to occupy and mobilize in. After going through this argument, I'll go over some basic points about space that we see as connecting what you all are doing to the establishment of curfew laws. And we'll open it to a further discussion from there. So our exploration of the flash mobs started um, almost two years ago now, when we were procrastinating you know, the reading we were supposed to be doing, um, <laughs> silly newspapers, and encountering constant stories. This was the spring um, and winter 2010, and the city freaking out about these things that they were calling flash mobs and responding to them, and kind of dove into it for a while, got caught up in other stuff, and came back to it because it's continued and escalated and actually become, we think, even more important. So in asking questions about the flash mobs, this idea, this kind of abstract collective figure that works to constrain and to discipline us, 
we've got a number of kind of burning and difficult questions that um, we need to work on to get it. We'll come back to them at the end, but I want to mention them now. We're asking, okay, so in the city of Philadelphia, how are different groups of people represented? How do these representations divide us against one another? How is public space regulated and controlled? And then the activist question, how can we occupy space in ways that forges new solidarities across lines of difference and creates new social relationships? These are the questions driving us as we're digging through newspaper articles and exploring how groups of young people are hailed by a state that's very clearly feeling threatened by them. The state's response highlights that there's something quite radical and important happening in these moments. To give you just one example, Philadelphia Councilman Jim Kenney called the flash mobs urban terrorism in the statement to the press in February 2010. He joined other councilmen and local law enforcement in supporting emergency security measures to confront what they describe as the escalating threat of disruptive youth in public space. Since that winter, Philadelphia, Philadelphia officials have adopted a series of aggressive, preemptive, and punitive measures as part of a citywide reaction to these occasional gatherings of young people. These range from an expansion of curfew zones for anyone under the age of 18, FBI monitoring of student cell phones and social networking websites, rapid response police strike forces, teams of undercover officers where gatherings are anticipated, felony convictions for juvenile participants, even court action against their parents. Councilman Kenny's declaration of urban terrorism was prompted by one group of 100 or so teenagers who gathered at a Center City shopping mall for a local dance troupe video shoot one Tuesday after school. 29 youth, ranging in age from 14 to 17, were arrested at this gathering and subsequently charged with felony rioting and conspiracy. Kevin Doherty, head judge of Philadelphia's juvenile and family courts, handled each of these cases personally and took a pointed stand against the offending youth before him, telling them that Philadelphia children were terrorizing Philadelphia citizens. <laughs> He also warned the juvenile standing before him to quote, if I find any of you get arrested for crossing the street the wrong way, I'm removing you from civilized society, end quote. Over the past two years, a zero tolerance approach to disorder has become a central feature of Mayor Nutter's administration. In a sermon to a West Philadelphia Baptist congregation this August, 2011, Nutter addressed an imaginary group, he evoked an imaginary group of disorderly young people, condemning them for casting their entire community in negative light, arguing that they shamed their own race. Groups of young people, and they're predominantly African-American teenagers, coordinating through use of social networking sites and cell phones, gather by the dozens, gathered by the dozens, hundreds, sometimes thousands, in parts of University City, Center City, and on South Street. And Vanessa's gonna go into much more detail about this map and the geography of laws in a minute. These groups have done so six times between the winters of 2009 and 2010, on each occasion displaying no signs or banners, voicing no chants, staging no discernible demonstration of particular political commands. The primary activity of these groups each time has been to move along the street until dispersed by the police forces that invariably arrive. Though there have been isolated incidents of fighting and property damage at a few of these gatherings, they have evidenced no pattern of violence or other criminal behavior. This is documented in all the newspaper stories, even if the title is, you know, violent, scary, threatening terrorists, flash mob. It's not the mere presence of the youth in these spaces that makes them disruptive either, because both the neighborhoods and the broad avenue that connect them are popular tourist attractions and commercial districts where businesses precisely target consumer demographics that include these young people. Business owners have actually been quoted in the newspaper as saying they wouldn't mind the flash mobs at all if only the kids would come with credit cards in their pockets. But these gatherings seem to consistently refuse the consumerist mandates of these spaces. At the same time, they're not a coordinated protest. They aren't expressing legible demands or grievances. That doesn't seem to be the organizing mechanism. And it's this very illegibility that is so fundamentally terrifying to the state and is the state's response that we've been scrutinizing. The flash mob as a concept is a potent political tool and one which the state is using, we argue, to secure power and to discipline how we behave in public space. 
here comes the geography, so put on your professional notes. Um, <laughs> it is not a coincidence that the urban spaces in which African American teens are so clearly troubling to city officials are also spaces of successful gentrification and citadelization. South Street, where many of these gatherings have occurred, serves as a physical corridor along the southern borders of University City and Center City, and also marks the symbolic boundary of what Peter Marcuse terms the citadel and the outcast ghetto. The citadel, according to Marcuse's definition, is created by a dominant group to protect and enhance its superior position. Today's outcast ghetto is home to those who have been accessed by the mainstream economy. And this map illustrates how stark the racialization of space is in the area. And so this boundary is sort of the initial temporary curfew zones that started to get implemented in reaction to these flash mobs. And this is what we're calling the citadel. And as you can see, what it's overlooked against is the distribution of percent African-American by neighborhood. And so these darker areas, this is mostly West Philly, you can see kind of the difference. And so the, what we're trying to kind of show here is that race and class, which are deeply connected to one another, right? Like your race tends to implode, like be highly correlated to class in the United States. And so you can see the way that that creates spatial segregation in the city and the areas where um, capitalism tends to flourish, right? This is sort of like the Wall Street space, if you will, for Philadelphia. And so the role of the state then is to enforce this process of segregation, to promote and protect the citadel while keeping the ghetto under control. And race has long served as a particularly potent tool of governance in such efforts. Racial divisions work to conceal and support the process of citadelization, which along with its co-constitutive process of ghettoization is a defining feature of contemporary globalization. Moreover, the process of citadelization is closely tied to the neoliberalization of the city the process by which the city seeks to run itself as an efficient business. According to a neoliberal ideology, urban regeneration serves the greater good of the city because of its ability to garner a tax base and to attract tourist dollars and white collar businesses. As a result, it becomes the responsibility of a neoliberal city government to protect and promote the citadels as the most profitable and capital conducive places in the city. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Philadelphia, like many Rust Belt cities, attempted to brand itself as a site of tourism and business through a demonstrated toughness on crime and ability to keep city spaces under control. Even decades before neoliberal gentrification, though, outcast ghettos were targets of tough on crime legislation and extreme forms of policing. There is a tension, then, within this policing of the ghetto between the city's need to maintain it as a central component of urban rent schemes, that is, by having these other areas, it makes rent more profitable in the sort of citadel sections, um, and the need to keep oppositional ghetto populations under control. This contradiction undergirds the youth gatherings in question. If University City and Center City are fortress citadels, their protection performed by ubiquitous gates and unwaved flags of banal nationalism, then South Street is the citadel's southern frontier buffering these sites of privilege and civilization from the ghettoized neighborhoods that surround them. Ghettoized populations are warehoused in schools, prisons, etc., and kept out of sight so as not to remind the privileged of the social costs of their protection. In Philadelphia, South Street marks a symbolic gateway between these two territories. It is worth noting at this point that extreme state responses to black social organizing in Philadelphia and elsewhere is nothing new. We have, of course, the infamous move bombing in 1985, and a common thread between the move bombing and today's preemptive strikes against African-American teenagers is this obfuscation of the realities of uneven development in the city. This is accomplished through a variety of discursive maneuverings. A denial of racism, a denial of class, a neoliberal ideological stance, etc. And we also see some shifts in this case. That is, in the way the city has been able to extend and generalize the reach of, each urban, of such urban security measures. We are no longer dealing with the labeling of organizations as threats to the city. Rather, the security state apparatus, which previously focused on discrete leftist organizations like MOVE, now hails as threatening whole cross-sections of the ghettoized urban public, who find themselves slipping precariously between being the objects of state protection or the targets of its war. So as we're sifting through all these newspaper angles and trying to understand what the state is doing here, how this is working, what the impact is on us as citizens, as activists. We see it as our job to interrogate the state's reading of these youth gatherings as flash mobs, to make the consequences of this kind of narrative visible, because it's very well hidden most of the time. 
and to work together to imagine an alternative possibilities and insist that these are these seemingly impossible things are very urgently needed. Because it's not only walls and gates that are put up in warehouse people. It's how identities and cultures are represented that warehouses people too. So we start this <laughs> daunting task by analyzing the current moment. The flash mob has been named and has as such become the target of Philadelphia's most recent anti-terrorism campaign, harnessing new levels of anxieties about terrorism, post-9-11, fear, and very old anxieties about the sources of disorder, danger, and criminality in urban spaces, which are inherently raised, classed, gendered, among other things. The term flash mob first appeared in Philadelphia's newspapers in June of 2009, and has since proliferated as a classification for any and all young people out of place in Philadelphia. It now carries with it strong connotations of a riot or a violent mob that invades what would otherwise be safe space. And it is this move in which the flash mob label assigns responsibility for incidents of violence that is most sinister. This collective abstract identity, which can be pinned to any person of a youthful age who happens to be prone to text messaging, turns into a presumption of guilt when affixed to those of certain color and class position. Such profiling comes at a horrible cost to individual suspects, many of whom committed no crime other than non-consumerist behavior in public space, and who will have to live the rest of their lives saddled with a felony conviction. It also serves, unconscionably, to obfuscate the very real threats to public safety in this city where there are daily lived reality for many residents. This narrative of the city and the flash mobs locked in battle over public space has become taken for granted in many ways with the emergence of this discourse. In a Philly Tribune article from August of this year, it's about Mayor Nutter's newly imposed anti-flash mob zones, which are actually the precursor to the curfew laws that have been put into effect most recently. They juxtapose a photo from a youth gathering on South Street in March 2010 with a photo of Mayor Nutter backed by his uniformed police officers and fellow policymakers, as though they're like advancing armies about to clash on the battlefield. And it does represent a kind of war, a war about representation, in fact. One in which the security state is winning on several important fronts. Because over time, since 2009 when the flash mob first appeared as a term, the construction of flash mob become urban terrorists has become routine, that's a huge success. Less and less discursive work is required to make the argument that these are terrifying, these are terrorism, these require security measures and curtailing similarities. Early analyses, way back in you know, the beginning of 2010, had to take great pains to articulate what precisely is so scary about the youth gatherings in question. In March 2010, a Philadelphia Choir editorial this is entitled Terror in a Flash. The editors have to first deflect the argument counter to theirs that these youth gatherings haven't actually resulted in any serious violence or property damage. The editors then assert that the real damage, the important concern for us, is that the city's brand might be damaged. They hammer away that capitalist flows will be impeded if the streets are perceived to be out of control. And this piece illuminates how the very naming of these otherwise ambiguous gatherings as flash mob is an attempt to contain their meaning, pin them down, and make them behave properly. As the narrative surrounding youth gatherings in Philadelphia has proliferated over the past two years, the assumption that flash mobs can be equated with terrorists has become a routine component, reinforcing these conceptual linkages between youth in public space and threats to public safety. An editorial published in 2011, this is September, in a paperwork from Delaware County, just right near Pennsylvania, doesn't have to work as hard. It can take these linkages for granted. Two years after flash mob first became a common concept. This argument's a breeze. You just evoke 
9-11 tariffs are tax on one hand. Philadelphia is a scary place on the other. And boom, we have to clamp down on civil liberties. Their argument here is that the problem is we're not using an expansive enough definition of terrorism. The authors of this editorial can rely on their readers, those in Pennsylvania and also from other states where numerous reprints appeared, to know exactly what they mean when they say, consider, if you will, what happened over the weekend to the city of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. The fetishism of the flash mob is familiar enough to everybody that it takes very little rhetorical labor to connect these unspecified happenings in Philadelphia to the events of September 11th, 2001. And the violence that is a daily reality for certain people in certain neighborhoods in Philadelphia is evoked to justify not increased social services and support systems, but an increased curtailing of civil rights. They're able to slide so casually between flash mob, flash mob riots, and urban terrorism as to seemingly equate the concepts. And this has a direct impact on people in public space in Philadelphia. Sentences for those convicted of participating in a flash mob, which isn't a very precise, I mean, people who are rounded up on the street during what the police call the flash mob, have increased dramatically from 2009 to 2010. Juveniles arrested in May and December 2009, the two incidents, were charged with misdemeanors, whereas almost all of those arrested in February and March 2010 were charged with felonies. And we've actually got newspaper quotes that we don't have up here about city officials considering charging African-American youth with hate crimes because it's white residents who are scared. Oh. <laughs> Philadelphia journalists are now quick to associate any incident or arrest at all involving a juvenile with what is framed as an escalating trend of flash mob riots. Articles reporting on the convictions of those arrested on the site of the supposed gathering will often list other arrests and convictions, sometimes of children as young as 11 years old, for unspecified charges of involvement in flash mob incidents. This is not limited to convictions for people arrested on the street. In fact, preemptive police measures have also become the norm. Now a flash mob doesn't actually need to happen at all because the potential for it to happen at any time, anywhere, has already been established. Anticipatory policing, policing sanctioned specifically by anti-terrorism surveillance legislation, has gone so far as to close Love Park after an apparent reference to a potential flash mob was perceived when they were monitoring online chatter. News headlines proclaimed Love Park shut down by threat of flash mob adding that social networking helped the police department shut down criminal activity. Criminal, hypothetical, potential criminal. <laughs> Near the park before it had a chance to begin. Let me read that again. Social networking helped the police department shut down criminal activity near the park before it had a chance to begin. Wow. Uh, Lieutenant Involt explained to news reporters that we, Philadelphia police, keep tabs on internet chatter, especially the, those social networking sites. And we received credible information that flash mob activity was going to form here. A fellow police officer near him chimed in. They want to gather in Love Park. We won't let them. We're trying to protect the public. This officer has no need to clarify who they are. They constitute a threat to us, the public. To protect us from them requires the sacrifice of our public space and our civil liberties as a matter of common sense. From this, we geographers turn to space, how it's regulated, what it means, how we're allowed, what we're allowed to do in it, who's not allowed to be in it, and bullet points that I'm sure are common sense to anyone who's tried to take a stand for rights in public space, but briefly, um, restrictions on space or restrictions on civil rights, what you can do where, what you can make public what grievances you can bring as concern that your government is responsible for are directly connected. <laughs> Rights to public space are, no surprise, unequal. Not everyone is allowed to be in certain spaces. Not everyone is allowed to express who they are in public spaces. And not everyone is allowed to do certain things in certain spaces. Right. 
And so, I mean, the sort of quintessential example of this is the way that homeless are quickly shuffled out of public spaces. And so, um, and then, you know, moving from that, spaces structure our social relationships. And so when we're in different spaces, there's different kinds of expectations to behave, right? And the example that Emma and I like to use a lot is that here we are at the front of this room with all of these chairs, which gives us a certain power over you all, right? You have to listen to what you said. Granted, you could get up and walk out. But there's this structuring of the way the space in this room is set up, right? Similarly, South Street is set up for you to go there and buy things and disrupting. And that's all about the reproduction of capitalism, right? And so if you don't go to South Street and buy things, and then moreover, because of sort of structural racism, if you are someone who scares the people that are buying things, right, through no behest of your own, then you're disrupting these sorts of behaviors. Similarly, I think you can make really similar movements and arguments about Occupy, and this moves us to the next point, right, which is that occupying space makes a difference. And so by disrupting, if there are those kinds of things that it, you may find problematic, like the sort of way that capitalism tends to work in this country, right, the simple renegotiation of the spaces that it depends on is sort of dis is disruptive, right, is part of taking a s action. And so in that way, there's certain <coughs> lines I think you can draw between flash mobs, which are definitely much less organized, right? And I don't want to be flippant about that point, but I think those parallels are, I think that those are kind of obvious. And so um, at that, we'll kind of move to some questions, and I believe there's someone else coming in after Can you guys just explain very quickly yes. um, the connections between the FBI and what's been happening with the occupations? Sure. Yeah. And so in the paper, I think there's copies of it. Flash the way that we originally framed this was really about the way that they're getting called terrorism and the way that the idea of anti-terrorism is being evoked to repress them. And so because of the Patriot Act there, and <laughs> I'm not, I have it all like written out somewhere, so I might not be able to get the legalities perfectly, but basically it's changed the ways, the legal ways that F people like the FBI and the CIA are able to monitor social networking websites. And the FBI has been monitoring, and it's very big, but the FBI has mo been monitoring social networking websites to prevent these flash mobs, and it's the page and that texting. Well. I right, they're also allowed to monitor texting. And, and the good. secondary portion that was, I believe, about in 2004 was the Safety Act, which was the contingency yes. off the Patriot Act that specifically targeted text messaging, sexting, and any type of communication between people under the age of 18. Right, yeah, you're right, you're right. And I it all. <laughs> in 2010, this is supposedly when city officials began in press releases framing these occurrences as terrorism and calling for the, for, you know, there'd be councilmen calling for Mayor Nutter if he's, you know, truly for the people of Philadelphia to demand that the FBI devote resources because New York gets to use anti terrorism stuff to protect terrorism. So Philadelphia needs to get the same things just because they're not. In Afghanistan doesn't mean we can't, we don't deserve resources. And this kind of talk is what got those, that money, that those uh, personnel, those technologies. And since then, they've been quite proud of the fact that they've been able to monitor. I, I don't think they are actually necessarily familiar with the kinds of, so they call everything Twitter, but they are monitoring a wide variety of, um, national and international, but also particular to Philadelphia online um, social networking. Actually, they have AT&T and Verizon doing it. Uh, I mean, we thought that it ended after the trade attack was over and all that, although, you know, stink went up. But there's a current case that will go up to the Supreme Court hopefully very soon uh, that actually challenges the fact that AT&T and Verizon continue to monitor it for that. So anything that you do with AT&T right now. Sprint is also in it, but Sprint is having financial problems of funding through. It's not because it's that much cooler. So it is actually, it is in operation right now. Right. Well, and I think it's worth mentioning also that, I mean, to some extent, it's just sort of become okay for the FBI to check out Twitter and people's text messages. And if you're not someone who has the resources to kind of fight the illegality of that, then you're sort of subject to that. But I mean, in some in some instances, the actual letter of the law doesn't matter because the police don't always follow them anyway. They just do these kinds of illegal surveillances. So. Hi, my name 
these two cheaper lines, and basically I'm going to just give y'all my point of view on Curfew. I live in West Philly, they're three stacks the market, and basically from what I've been seeing, like 7 o'clock in the morning, it's like one cop car, one block, you go to the next corner, there's one right here, and you got cops on dirt bikes that ride by. I wonder where these resources from, but I don't have questions because I'm young. I have a voice, I guess. And one day my brother, he was walking home, and I had a hand in his pants, I don't know what he was doing, but he thought he had a gun on him or something. So another couple car pulled up, and they pulled two guns out of him. I told him on the concrete and it'll be a pocket. Now, if any of y'all have like younger siblings, y'all been putting that as well. I was pretty disturbed in that because we all really going on the concrete. And we pulled our guns. My other one brother, he said he was scared, so I'm like, I can't do anything about that because they're cops. They have a door. They have a like a plastic bag in their chest, so I guess I think they have power. So basically that's what I've been seeing the curfew and all this, but basically it's like why do you put so much effort into my neighborhood, but when the kid are getting beat up or jump, you don't put any type of effort at all. But it gets terrorism, it gets kids organizing yourself, do something, I guess. I don't think it's disruptive, but it's something, though. Know, it's that what the heck kids might even have done. So, that's basically what I have to say. Thanks, kids. If you have questions right now about the presentation, you can ask them. Um, we're nearing 7 o'clock, and so uh, we have wanted to do some breakout session, a breakout session, which we might not be able to do, which is fine. Um, but one of the things that I wanted you guys to know before we kind of move into this section is that um, one, we're thinking about doing a direct action. This was voted, uh, uh, the making the law more strict was voted recently, about two weeks ago. Um, and so we're thinking of November 17th doing a direct action. And if you're interested in that, we would like you to sign a sheet with your email address. Um, we're probably not going to describe too many of the details. Part, well, I guess you can understand that now that you've seen the presentation. But um, we will be meeting about 15 to 20 minutes before the city council meeting, maybe earlier than that, to explain what's going to happen. And then we'll walk in. Um, so just to give you a heads up, and I don't know, Adam, if you can put a piece of paper and a pen maybe back there so that people can sign on the way out. Um, and there was one more thing that I can't remember. Oh, the other thing that we were going to brainstorm tonight that we might not have time for is very concrete proposals, right? And so I, I've been doing all this research on social movements. And if you have a problem, then the other thing, the second stage that we can do as a movement is propose solutions. If the curfew is the problem, then we need very concrete solutions to um, the curfew, both as a problem that the city is forcing on us, but also possibly proposals to ask the city for in, in place of the curfew. Um, and we need to do research about how much money this curfew is costing in enforcement to actually uh, offer like solid alternatives. But if you guys can kind of start thinking about that, I don't know if you're all on the curfew list, um, and if you're not, uh, you should add yourself onto it, but also we can just start generating that stuff um, so we can move forward as a movement uh, and just start shaking things up so that kids in Philly don't continue to be terrorized. So we can just kind of open it up. Denise is going to, I guess, facilitate the discussion, but um, open it up for the Q&A uh, right now. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think... So it's really just an exchange, you know, what was your impression of the material that was shared and, you know, they might be able to ask more specific, or answer more specific, um, offer more specific details to questions that you have. Just, I, I want to compliment you. That was a yeah. wonderful presentation. And I think we should Thank repeat you. this presentation in lots of sites. Uh, but I do want to also uh, kind of point out that, you know, it, it sets up two things. The first is, you know, I was talking to a Philadelphia Weekly uh, reporter. They were thinking of doing a, um, an editorial on this because of many of our actions. And he said, you know, when, we, when I interviewed Mayor Nutter, he said, Not, people are just not going to be arrested for this, right? It's going to be in the books, but we know we can't go about arresting everybody. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a shake hand kind of agreement. 
not very many people have been arrested. Um, and that's really even more problematic because I almost wish that these laws were implemented as crazily as they've been formulated because that really shows up how horrendous it is because what they are now formulating is, is a typical police state because what it means in a good, in an efficient, in a wonderful police state as and not that those are <laughs> those make sense but just categories in a democratic <laughs> state, right? <laughs> uh, which this is. But say Singapore, for example, uh, where, where my parents live. You have laws in the books. All you need to do is to make sure that you you have two or three people and you throw them in prison because of it. And then the fear of being a constant criminal is what really surveils and fixes you. That's even scarier to me that, you know, a law that is that, that is shown up to be unfair to the people because it's constantly being imposed to keep people down. So that's one thing. The other thing I'd like to point out is I I think we should really problematize the word curfew, right? Because it it buys into the discourse of good parenting. Mm -hmm. Often, you know, a state cannot parent our kids, should not, must not parent our kids, right? So whenever you take a take uh, issue with this, people are like, but, but kids should have curfews. Of course, what is what is hinted is that you know it's a state imposing curfew and it's taking away the agency of parents, etc. Mm -hmm. So we really need call it for what it is. Call it what it is. It is the Jim Crow. It's new mm -hmm. Jim Crow law. It's a segregation three law, and this is what, by law, by legal definition, I'm talking law here. That is exactly what Jim Crow came out to be, and they first got kids mm -hmm. when Jim Crow was imposed. If we know our history, so we need to make that these connections, and we need to make them quickly, and we need to say these. This is the new Jim Crow, maybe the new John Crow. I don't care, but we can. We do not. We should not be engaging with the discourse of curfew. Right. They're also trying to criminalize young adults, but but political pressure made them realize that they couldn't get it passed. Well, there's a lot of important points made in there, and one, and one that is an immediate smackdown to the narratives that legitimately make a lot of these things seem legitimately moved to protect public safety is that what laws like the curfew do, we, I mean, you hear so many personal accounts of this, is that it creates impunity for the violence that plagues Philadelphia, that people suffer but can't get recourse for. The, one of the first headlines to come out after they instituted flash mobs as a particular response to terrifying flash mobs was, was it, it was, was um, young kid killed out after curfew. Yeah. It's an explanation. He had got what was coming to him because he disobeyed the law. Are there are there other cities that this this type of curfew has been affected, or um, other cities that have had flash mob experiences, and how have those cities handled it? Do you know? There were. Uh, actually, okay. I know that in uh, uh, 2007, New Rochelle, right outside of New York City, had some flash mobs uh, happening then. Um, they, it was just kind of a one-year phenomenon. But, uh, just kind of dissipated. So there's no other model to look no, to? No, there is actually. Oh. So curfew laws, and, and these have been called flash mobs recently, but they've been called other things at other periods. Uh, I have a whole, you know, two papers, I send it out to whoever there have been some good research done on this, especially in California. In California, there have been a number of counties that and cities that have established extremely draconian curfew laws and other cities that haven't. So you can do a comparison. And there was one that's, that's been taken up to the courts, uh, and the Supreme Court refused to hear it. Uh, that was in uh, New Orleans. So it's been, it's been tried all over, in Boston, New York, all over. Um, there is no association of curfew law imposition and level of violence or criminal activity amongst um, adolescents. Quite the opposite, it's been shown that uh, cities that impose curfew laws, there is a positive, significant correlation with a uh, criminal activity amongst young folks. So it's quite the opposite of what the city says it's going to do. And that's research that has been done over the last, you know, seven or eight years, and I, I can, I'm happy to share this research with you. Well, can I just speak to the, the flash mobs in other cities point, which I, just to kind of clarify, which is that the idea of a flash mob, there's, there's sort of two 
I would say now that you see these two categories of flash mobs, right? And the first is this sort of innocent um, flash mob where people right. get together and they do a dance or they have a pillow fight. And some of those have been met. Like there was one in San Francisco many years ago, maybe in 2004, that there was a bit of an outcry because it was like, oh my God, the cleanup for the pillows was so expensive. And so there's those flash mobs. And then this kind, which is more young, generally minority teens, has been basically it's sort of like this has started in Philadelphia and now it's spreading across the nation. And so I hadn't heard of the one in New York, but that's kind of the discourse. And there's been some in Chicago, Baltimore, and then and then there's these things where like you know ten kids will run into like a grocery store or like a convenience store and rob the place, and they'll call that a flash mob. And it's like, well, no, actually that was just a robbery. And so there's like these sort of slippages between. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm from Chicago, and this summer there was a number of occasions where it'd be like ten to twenty people would like ransack a McDonald's or something, and it would just be flash mob, flash mob. There was police all over the streets for like uh, at least a month. Like I mean, my, my mom would tell me not to go out late, like like really like but that's not that's been going on. But nothing the, like those exact events are then used exactly. to conflate as though it's the same group of young people intent on terrorism showing up everywhere, which means blanket curtailing the civil rights everywhere. And the, the reinforcing that this is a devolution of people who need to be disciplined is evident. We only actually have one appearance, hoping we had more, but the, I mean, Philly newspapers were evoking those things and then waxing nostalgic for the good old days of flash mobs when they were just dancing or, you know, doing freeze poses or blowing bubbles. And Which is what, probably what they were going to do in Love Park that day. Right. That they <laughs> had never done. Well, the first one was a dance yeah, trip drive yeah. snowballs. The kids that got around. Yeah, the, the snowballs. Fight, yeah. But the underlying, what they don't say and they don't need to because they know they're obvious well, is that the good ones were wealthy white kids who aren't scared. And the bad ones are don't have to be different behavior. Don't have to be different. I mean, just and can we just make sure that we also bring the fact that Philly is being looked at by the UK? It's being looked at internationally as a model of how to curb youth. Um, after the riots, people were like, you know, we should be looking at what Philadelphia is doing, right? And, and specifically, the riots in the UK were raced in class. Um, and so it's, you know, class warfare. And there was also France a few years before, Paris and so on, which also had this very, uh, you know, urban, young, uh, black, brown population, you know, basically um, confronting, you know, the inequity of that society. But of course, those uprisings are once again characterized in this terroristic fashion. But I think even more importantly is just to say that most of these uh, flashes um, with kids buying stuff and hanging out, it's only like, again, this tiny percentage that have turned violent. We're talking about a dozen or two dozen at most out of thousands. But yet that's, the media zooms in on that and makes it seem like there was thousands of terrorists, right? Do you have a question over here? Well, I was just asking another Bailey, I just remember what Bailey was saying in terms of like other cities and models of what was happening before the California context. It's sort of more the original curfew law in Philly where there was you know, specific zones it was limited to. The other way that this gets taken up, especially on the West, is like the gang injunctions, where there's certain stresses and certain swaths swath of the population that are then, they have extremely like, you know, the 3 p.m. to 8 a.m. curfew on them in certain places because they're on a list of people that are in gangs. And then most recently, you know, we overturned this, but they had like, you know, several hundred, like several dozen John and Jane Doe's. So they could just say, well, we can't release the name of this person. So they basically had slots for, and then in, in different areas, either black or Latino teens to be added to the list because it was anonymous, but it was like a block by block and much greater time frame. That's another way that people organize how to control our bodies. So, many, oh, um, I just really wanted to say I really appreciated the way you look at this through a spatial lens, um, and I think that is the right lens. I was just wondering um, if you guys, so you guys are we're studying geography, and I'm just wondering, um, I guess, how the discipline, like what it's like studying it in that discipline. If that makes sense. Like something like this, which is like really political and really contentious, and. When I think of geography, I think of like map making, and um, but this is really, really different and really interesting. I was just wondering what your experience has been like 
in the geography department such as kind of issue? It depends on, I mean, it's <laughs> place specific, um, where you're a student who you're working under, what the goal of your degree is. This is actually transgressive to our degree program, of course, and we got really compelled by this politically um, and intellectually, but more important, like this is an issue that we feel personally about and not, I mean, like, I don't tell my advisor, advisor I'm doing this until I'm done. Um, and you can find pockets of geography. It's actually been a safe space for radical um, theory over decades, mostly because it was deemed irrelevant after World War II when they didn't need colonial map makers anymore. Uh, the Ivy Leagues got rid of their geography departments, which turned out to be a relatively good thing for those of us who want to do theory without scrutiny. But you can find, I mean, we're at Penn State. You've got some of the most important radical geographers doing incredible work, but we're in the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences. We're, we're supposed to be, you know, in a lab, in a lab doing our advisors' experiments, and everyone who shares a building with us thinks that we study rocks. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's, it's called critical geography, and um, there's like a MacArthur genius who's at Syracuse named Don Mitchell who does critical geography. There are a lot of he actually, actually went to Penn State. Yeah, there are a lot of badass, I mean, he taught at the University of Colorado, and so there are like some super badass geographers who are looking at race and space and homelessness and prisons. I mean, they're like, they're doing some badass, like critical work, um, if you guys are interested in that kind of stuff. In fact, if you read it, it's kind of inspirational in terms of just being a scholar in general, I think. Ruth Wilson Gilmer is yeah. a really important name. Um, Laura Polito. You'd like more information about the Arctic oh, I don't know if this would be useful to other people, so I can just kind of get this information on my own if, if, if that's better. But I'm just wondering if someone could give like a really quick lowdown of what the curfew, the specifics of what the curfew law, or the, or the segregationist law, if you want to change the language around it, um, is um, it, how it's working right now. I understand it was recently ratcheted up. Um, yeah, I can do that. Um, well, I can do it to the best of my ability. The law is vague in certain ways, and I think on purpose. Um, so it expands the mayor's powers, um, but we, his emergency powers, which were the ones that made uh, Center, C Center City, University City, special protected areas during the summer, um, that where the curfew was being enforced specifically. Um, and it, it basically, the new law, the way it's more strict is that it ups the ante. So what they first want to do is put parents in prison up to 90 days and kids in prison up to 90 days for violating curfew. Um, but they took that out, I think. Uh, supposedly they took it out. But again, I'm not sure how it links up to the mayor's emergency power, so I'm not really, it's, it's vague on that. Um, but it upped it to $500, um, which I think most of you know can easily put a family under the bus. It's also not clear what happens if a parent can't pay the curfew, and so I'm not sure if incarceration is looped in on that at that end. Um, it creates very special brackets for who can um, be out at what time, depending on age groups. Um, but for me, like my personal impact is that that means I can't take my little brother out. He's 13. You have to be with a parent or guardian or on an errand for a parent or guardian um, or, uh, or work. If you work, then you can break curfew, but we've also heard reports of people who are coming home from work and a cop gives them a ticket, right? And then your parents either have to take off to fight the ticket. You can't miss school if you're going to fight the ticket. So they basically don't really have any remedy if they do get tickets <coughs> illegally. Um, there's no so basically it's just kind of a harassment law, like a legalized harassment law. It's a juvenile stop and frisk. It's basically what's happening. Um, it has um, I put, why do I Akiba? Why do I keep wanting to put an S in your name? Akiba line pointed out. You know, little kids. One of the kids who got arrested is 11, right? So, and he's like, they really wanted to make an example out of him this summer. <laughs> and so, not just deep on the street. I, so, there's the leeway that the police have. Yes. And there is free reign. Publicly and accessible areas. So, like movie theaters and, oh. and malls and shopping spaces. So, it's not just public, but publicly accessible. So, which is why I said I can't take my brother to a movie or a set or, or an orchestra or a theater, right? Like this is all these things that now make it illegal for um, even adults. So it also censures the people over uh, 21. And that vagueness in the law is, is explicit free reign to, for example, that judge who's really taking possession of all of these court cases over the summer when these were being put into effect. 
he had a child who said that he was getting milk for his mother, a mother verifying that he was trying to go to the store when he was caught up in what the police were calling a flash mob and being charged with a felony, and the mother was in juvenile court begging the judge to put her in jail instead because her child was in school. And the judge, after basically calling her a prostitute, exercise, aside from his rhetoric, which is pump circumstance and applying for attention, he has legal leeway to assign basically whatever he wants to children and their parents. What judge is this? And that's what this yes. new yes. 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 provision is called. Yes. It's yes. called yes. parental yes. responsibility yes. for uh, minors, right? So that's what this new thing that was passed recently was was specifically called. It wasn't even, the word curfew wasn't even mentioned mm -hmm. in the law. And then the brackets, I mean, like on the most concrete level, it's like weekdays, eight, nine, and 10. Yeah. Right? For like 13 and under is eight, yeah. 14, 15, 16. It's hard for me to keep track because it's 17, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, because I know, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to keep people from GA, if that's what you, um, but do we have, can you guys just show me if we have like 10 minutes more, if we can keep going, and if not, if you need to go, then, okay. Go ahead. Did you have a comment or a question? Oh, it seems like, I mean, this is implied, but I don't know that directly. It seems like, you know, if you have this like parental, like you can write a parental note, it seems like that's pretty much null and void because since the law is structured to hold parents responsible, it means that they become a defendant in the case. So then anything that they say to to, to excuse the, the other person to say that, oh, well, this isn't what happened, it's more suspect than it would be otherwise, because they're standing trial too. They're not even, you know. So it seems like it's not. So I just wanted to kind of introduce my own concern is what's next? It seems like we're all on the same page, like we don't agree with this, we don't like it, it's bad. So what do we want to, how do we want to maximize our time and power for the next 10 minutes before we move on? I know personally that I, I don't remember who mentioned that you're constantly running into people who say, well, why should the kids be out? I think informing people is really important on why this isn't just a, we need to keep our kids safe. Um, and off with them in our house, like, because that's all I hear all day long. Yeah, it's well, either the kids aren't safe or the kids are terrorists, right? Yeah. It's either one. Or the, if they're bad parents. Right. Like, right. The, yeah. if, if the parents are bad, so the city has to step in. Like, no, there's so little understanding. Right. Yeah, Occupy itself, I don't really know how long the whole camp thing can go on. I mean, people can debate that, but um, I think things like this are, are crucial for Occupy because. We're going to need to do something where we don't, you know, have to stay there forever, where we can just have weekly meetings and do actions about a specific thing. So I really think we need to take this to the whole occupied population, not make it this separate thing where we're cordoned off, take it to the direct action committee, take it to the GA, because this, like, this is precisely it, you know. And, and I mean, we, we do need to bring, um, figure out a way to link up, you know, the, the concerns that seem predominant in the occupied movement with, you know, like, you know, connecting race and class and showing that this is part of both the race and class struggle. Okay. We're going to go right here and go back and up here. And let's keep our comments kind of brief, particularly if you're having repeat commenters. I just want to reiterate what the um, professor said about um, changing the language of it and calling it what it is. And I feel as though using triggering words like segregation as they are using words like terrorism, it'll really catch them. Uh, I just want to maybe you know, bring up two things. We have the sign up, of course, going in the back. One of the things is uh, the person who sponsored the curfew bill, Councilwoman Brown, I believe her name was, invited people who were interested to come to a meeting. And I believe City Council reconvenes not this Thursday, but the following Thursday. So I think we should all show up for a meeting. Yeah. So we can all talk to City Council about this urgent matter that meeting. The second thing I would propose, and this is more long term, not so much an occupied thing, but to contact people in the flash mob, I know some, about doing some kind of uh, resistance or some of the curfew for Christmas. 
So the hardest items for all will be Okay, so can I just say that there's been several, I just want to intervene because we've been doing this for the last two weeks, so I just want to put out what we've been talking about so you guys know. Um, we have direct action as one of the ways we've been thinking about doing moving forward on this. We have community action research, which would involve people like Akiva and, um, and maybe his, his peers and also teachers, like people who are actually in Philly and throughout Philly to really start figuring out how we can evaluate this curfew um, and moving forward so that, because supposedly this curfew has a sunset provision, which means they have to revisit it. It's not a permanent law right now. Um, and so we want to make sure that there's actual evaluation that's been fostered between ideally maybe Penn and Drexel, Penn and Temple, and, and put that forward when the time comes. And maybe even in a year, forget, wait for two years, we can say we've actually been tracking this law. So that's one thing. Um, does anybody remember the other two? There were two uh, more. Uh, huh? Outreach. Outreach, right? So one of the issues is that we've been had having trouble reaching Philadelphia youth. Clearly, they can like assemble 500 of them in like 20 minutes flat, but we have not been able to get like five of them in a row. So, um, if so, that's one of the issues that we've been having. We've reached out to the Philadelphia Student Union, but we haven't been able to lock in on them. And I think part of it is just presence. Um, and then, what do you work with the last one? Um, so we have um, outreach and also research. Um, direct action. Direct action. Oh, and then advocacy, right? So also trying to talk to city council members and have meetings with different city council members. Um, and so maybe one of one of the things we can do is start making that list clear that people can sign up for those specific groups uh, under those. But I guess right now what I'm wondering is, um, so we have direct action. Yeah. That's all. So there's a legal thing that just has started this week. So we want to document everything that happens with movement. You know, if you know people are getting arrested, you know, we are, we're going to take it to the Supreme Court, so. Yeah. And you can report to the ACLU, but right here with these people in this room, right, are you guys, like, passionate about this? Does it seem like something that you would want to keep advocating on? Um, we understand that it's, it's an intersectional issue, so it's not just about how the city deals with youth, but also the resources made by the city for youth um, and the resources that they have available. It's also about youth violence. It's also about education. Um, and so we understand all of those things. But I guess we need we need a couple of concrete things like to move forward on, if that makes sense, besides the community action. Like does anybody have any suggestions? I keep on sorry. Um, no, this doesn't have anything to do. But when you said if we talk to you, I don't mean to stress this a lot, but if we get the wrong youth that comes down and like I mean like messing up everything and actually push to what the city is trying to do, it won't be fight for nothing. So I think y'all should keep that in mind that ex youth to come up. Let me how many of them would stick around a geography presentation? Not that many. Yeah, I have my use here, and I get more fun. Like, have no focus, and I none. Um, but anyway, I just want to throw out some of the stuff we've been talking about for the last few weeks, just to catch everybody up. Right. Also, kind of a concrete thing, which is that, and this gets to sort of the using different language and, and this idea of this curfew being this thing that we're doing for the kids, I think that there really needs to be like a counter set of things about how to let young people live in a city well, and what that means and what that looks like, because there's no, th I mean, one of the things, and this is what I think we're getting at, right, is that the city has been able to dictate the terms of this, right, to dictate how kids are and what kids need, and kids need, the kids and their parents need a curfew, and I think that having like a counter set of concrete things that the city should be doing that kids need that are in a curfew is a really good way to go. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of the same argument that we come up against every issue, like why are children dropping out of school? They're not supported in school. Why are uh, young girls becoming pregnant? They're not supported in that need. Like why, why, why is that? they're that in for people to say but the kids need to be kept in the house because there's no support for them otherwise so it, it's you know the bigger issue in creating a safe havens for these kids and positive out you know outlets for them it is a huge battle that we come up against in every topic in in education and health care and like Arguably, a lot less expensive than monitoring everybody's self representation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, why are the ninety nine percent of shit lives? Yeah. Why? Why aren't? Why aren't people's real needs being met? This is like, this brings us back to the whole point of life. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'm inclined to believe that perhaps a pragmatic next step would include creating some type of um, informative tool to educate parents and teachers yes. and kids um, and just the community, like That's not those who are here. And, at City Hall, but we know we're here. Yeah. Like we, that's, we need but, to reach the people who need to know. Right. To create a tool that would include, you know, what the effect of, that fear has on not just, you know, the suburbanites or, or white people, but mm -hmm. other black people because they're buying into it. And, you know, people that, you know, are in the community and the parents. Um, on that tip, I don't know. I think in addition to changing the jargon, also combining messaging and strategy. So I think it's something that we've all been talking about a lot in the last week and a half, um, which is a huge Philadelphia issue, but is also a huge Occupy issue and a huge city issue is police brutality. And I think reframing this as police brutality and educating people, in, because this is, this is not... Everyone talks about how police brutality comes because of what the, you know, what the city does, what the protesters do, what the, what the violent kids do, right? But really, if you're showing lots, cause I mean, I was at that snowball flash bomb, and it was like a really fun day. And when I woke up the next morning and saw the media coverage on it, I literally thought that I was insane. Because I remember standing there watching what happened, and then the one incident of violence that came that was provoked by the police is what got covered. So I think framing the issues, like we've been talking a lot about doing cop watch trainings, about doing know your rights trainings, about doing trainings that aren't just for like activists and like in, in the know type people, but for communities and also figuring out what things they're already doing. Because like, like you just said, like this is a very organized group of individuals. They can like send a tweet out and get 500 people somewhere in 30 seconds, right? So they're already very organized, they're just not networked. And framing the issues and combining the messaging would be really powerful because police brutality is a, is an issue that this city would get behind in a minute. Right. Yeah, I think um, quickly. Um, yeah, I, I totally support that. And I think it's reframing what the issue is, and it's organ organization, organized community organizing one on one. Yes. So I think we talked about this last time, perhaps starting with a needs assessment, yes. um, and then also just consider. You know, this is kind of new for probably a lot of us, but there are a lot of other agencies that have been working in the community around this issue, and I think we probably need to maybe reach out to them and collaborate with them and figure out what they're doing. Just uh, FYI, there's a flyer on the table. There's a stop and frisk um, workshop and panel discussion um, happening this Saturday, and it's free. They provide food, breakfast, and lunch, um, and great information. But I think very strongly that we, you know, not to get ahead of ourselves, but like really check ourselves and see what, you know, some of these organizations are doing because they've put in some time and effort and are making moves and to kind of come in at the end and try to recreate something slows us down. Is that it? Yep. Okay. Um, I think the point about like you wrote after school programs is is like a good point, but I think that in response to that, someone also, like, even that is sort of a coddling of the youth to some extent. But, like, part of, like, when I was 16, where I came was actually here. Like, I'd get on the train, come here, and I'd do, like, unsanctioned political, like, I'd be meeting with people who were in college already. And I don't, that doesn't really fit into that kind of, like, after school program, like, you know, structured event. Like, it was just part of what youth need is just to be able to, like, decide to do whatever they want to do. Be autonomous. Yeah. 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 Right behind you. Um, and going off uh, what was said about police brutality, like this should be intimately linked uh, to uh, resisting uh, stop and frisk, uh, especially if we're talking about you know, like these policies that produce categories of people that are presumed as guilty on site and as violent on site. Um, yeah, I, I was I was just gonna say that I, I really think that doing um, like having meetings with parents at school is is something that's very very important and something that I think seems to be a very kind of pragmatic, concrete step to try to focus uh, towards. And also, I, mean, I, I think for me, this is you know this isn't a historical. You know, this is like this is something for me that it's just uh, it's just another form of domination of, of, of the powerful, of the people who are ruling. You know, it's no different. They don't know when you know the banks 
for redlining, you know, and I came out and I'm prohibiting certain people from getting mortgages and certain people from living in certain areas in the city. Um, so I think it's important to educate that this isn't, this isn't, you know, yes, police brutality, you know, is a bad thing, and this kind of, you know, this kind of ties into police brutality, and police brutality has characteristics, but a lot of other different things that are wrong with society, but I think ultimately, you know, it is just another form of domination, I think it's, I think it's important to educate around that and, and show other examples of how that works and how, and how the ruling and the powerful really do what they do. So. Just another a footnote before, um, if you're leaving, can you just make sure you, if you're interested in doing direct action at this meeting, this upcoming city hall meeting, please put your name down before you go, um, just so we know who's up for direct action. Okay. I think that the linkage between the stop and frisk and this all being under the same umbrella is important with when dealing with the community who's sort of confused about why this is a bad thing. Because a lot more people understand, a lot more youth when I say stop and frisk, when I'm just doing one-on-one -on -one conversation, the stop and frisk is more concrete and understandable, even to the youth and their parents, and understanding why this is wrong. So if we can make a direct link that way, we can probably reach a lot of people. Um, really quickly, I, I think, you know, funding for education is a big part of this, but there's an even deeper level because a lot of people drop out of school because they feel like they have no future. So I think one of our core demands actually has to be providing public sector or, or public created jobs. And, and honestly, there's no reason in this country that we cannot have 100% employment. Employment should be a right, and I think that should be one of the core demands of this whole movement, like all these movements we're in, because like that, that's what really gets to the bottom of it all. That's what really would address the agitation that drives people to riot or flash mob or whatever. Um, I have a question uh, about, um, right, let me say, say this succinctly. Uh, all right, so the 99% is a pretty diverse group. And some of the 99% are far more underserved than other parts. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main thing that I think we need to work on in the whole Occupy movement. Yeah. I'm just asking this question for the Occupy movement because that's what's happening right now. But I thought in terms of messaging to the Occupy movement, how, where can I find more arguments about how underserved communities are directly impacted by corporate greed, by bailouts, etc.? I was just wondering, not that that has to be the main argument, but for Occupy, where will I find uh, a good resource that kind of makes those succinct arguments that as a result of what occupies opposing the underserved communities and the flash mobs are directly a result, curfew laws are directly a result of this. I think the good way to reach the larger Occupy movement is to make the geography linkage that occupying the spaces makes a difference. Yeah, which is what I've been trying to say that the occupying a public space in general yeah. is, is powerful. Thank you. I'm sorry. Can we just go back here? And then this is something I guess to earlier. I, I do think that creating a informal tool is or informational tool is really important, um, like a, a brochure or something. And I'm thinking about the police brutality. When that packet went out at Occupy about police, are the police are not our friends. And I think that had a really big impact. So I think that's a tool for Occupy to get more of Occupy involved, but also that we can all take back to our communities and the after school groups that we work with. Um, I um, was just wondering if you are, are they technically not allowed to be at Occupy after a certain time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Have there been any issues with that? Well, I'm down here, so. uh, but you, you know, we'll the, the from the, the, the limited interactions that I've had with persons who are over the age of 21 that have brought people under the age of 18 there, there hasn't been any incidences that we've noticed, but the but our thought on that is that it's because Occupy is there, which is another really strategic messaging point for why we should resist the move is because not only will are we kind of on some level standing in the way of the police brutalizing the homeless once we move from there, but we're also standing in the way of brutalizing youth. I just want to point out um, there's something that you know people could show or whatever. I made a piece of propaganda that's on YouTube called My Another Sermon that takes his uh, what he was talking about the youth and putting it to the footage of police brutality here in Philadelphia during his administration as an arm mayor. So um, just something that could be used as a possible teaching tool definitely directed into that. What's it called again? Michael Nutter's sermon. Anybody? <coughs> <coughs> uh, I, I, I'm in town for a couple days brought to my Wall Street and um, 
I know I, uh, there's a kind of growing movement with the, for the subs in, in New York. Um, and Cornell West is one of the one of the two people that are kind of spearheading it. Yeah, and we want him to come here because well, he'll be in town in a month, and we need somebody to reach out to him if anybody can feels comfortable doing that. Um, he'll be here. He's an well, avid tweeter. That, that's what I was I was going to be asking because um, for their first action, Cornell West was there. He got arrested, and it made like national international news. And I, I got arrested with other people in the second action. There was hardly any news coverage at all for it, and so. At least in trying to get the message out there. I mean, he's kind of an internationally known figure, and would really kind of help to kind of get that kind of message. Go so an email on the Princeton Religion Department website. You can just call his office. So I went. I just want to throw out he's coming um, specifically for um, like a political demonstration surrounding the Mia. So I, I certainly don't want to hijack um, that movement because that's big and it's long-standing. But it would be great if we could collaborate. And it is an opportunity to kind of um, exploit that moment. I have reached out to him. Um, I haven't actually spoken with him. I've talking. I've spoken with these people, uh, <laughs> which is a run around. But um, and I know a friend has gotten his email address, and so we could try. Yeah, we could keep trying. I didn't know he was going to be in town. I contacted them two weeks ago. So. It's December 9th. I wanted to ask, I mean, obviously a, a broad coalition of groups and individuals fight something like this. Uh, to what degree so far are other organizations like the Teachers Union uh, or uh, uh, the CLU, you know, Civil Liberties, black organizations and so on uh, behind this issue, if, if at all. Yeah. Teachers Again, uh, Teachers Action Group, is that, am I saying the right tag, okay. has come out to support us. Um, PSU is definitely against curfew. They're just kind of leery of OP, I think, for other reasons. And so they um, haven't kind of supported us necessarily, but they support against the curfew. Um, the incarcerated PA uh, showed up. We had young youth arts. Youth Arts, some, uh, yes, we had YASP yes, show up, um, which is a youth arts movement here in Philly. But um, we haven't kind of been able to, I mean, this is, you know, we're having this meeting now, but yeah, we're trying coalition build right now. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have a lot of solid ideas. Um, that's awesome. We have, I hope this presentation guys got you guys kind of invigorated in terms of thinking about this and moving forward. I. Imagine that this is going to shake up Philly. And that's what I'm hoping we do. I hope that we can build. And maybe I like, I really love the Kids Living Well campaign. And maybe if we can come up with like a better title, that can be the title of what we're doing instead of just being anti curfew. We can be like pro Philadelphian kids in some way and then really unite everybody under that kind of a banner and really start kind of systematically building an alliance. Because there are a lot of people in the city who care about kids and they're working. Um, there was something else that I wanted to throw out there, but I can't remember what it is. So um, I appreciate you guys showing up, but I also hope that you can show up in these other ways in terms of doing stuff. Um, the There's never action list in the back. Oh, damn it, there's something else that I'm forgetting. That was important, but I can't remember. Um, can I, yeah, can I interject? So I just want to throw out to everybody, what's the next step? I don't, I don't, I don't know that, I don't know what's resolved here. And I don't know that having another meeting and then talking about the same list moves us anywhere. So I, I mean, I don't. I'm not saying like let's close and go think about. It. I'm saying can we decide something today? Can we? I, I reiterate that um, I've got a list for the for the direct action for next Thursday, and uh, we could talk uh, in, uh, concretely about doing something for Black Friday or for Christmas uh, that would get the youth up. I'm, I'm down for those either so direct action for Thursday. I'm down to act. Uh, cool, yeah, I mean, I, I think we, I was brought up maybe two meetings ago, and I, I don't know, and this, this time we just brought up now. I mean, I think building coalitions amongst organizations is very important. Uh, I think that could just be a responsibility of some people who kind of divvy out certain responsibilities, like who wants to take on, you know, contacting schools, contacting PSU, contacting different organizations that work with students, and trying to organize meetings, trying to organize this conference, and different things like that. I think that can just be, you know, some sort of responsibility. Um, 
And I had something else I forgot, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and just on the coalition building tip, I think that there's another, um, on Thursday, the Women's Community Revitalization Project is coming here, well, actually it's at the church, but they are doing a presentation and a panel on, it's called Take Back Our Vacant Land, which is their main campaign, it's a community land trust campaign, and it uses the same geography model of restriction to access and of, like, uh, Women's Community Revitalization Project. WCRP, and it's at 3 p.m. at the church, the corner of Broad and Arch. And they are also, they have a long history of doing work against foreclosures and against, like, the segregation of space and against, like, the lack of access in terms of classism to the different communities in Philadelphia. And they are very interested in doing coalition building and about getting behind all of these issues as well. So I think we should, like, in your whole, I like, totally agree with the whole, um, Spirit of not kind of reinventing the wheel don't have to yet. Like working with the groups that are currently involved right now. Like we had a meeting last night and I'm talking about about the Aspia Sabor anti police brutality group. We've got people working with um, I have contacts in PSU that I'm gonna contact. So like writing that down right now. So that those people are at this meeting next time we have it. That was three PM which day? Thursday. It's three PM at <coughs> Broad Arch, Methodist Church, Broad Arch. So, uh, I want to go back. Did you have something? So, yeah. Quick, some of these will be the long term, like the research right, yeah. and the um, reaching out to schools, etc., and having teachers at schools. But do keep in touch. Uh, some of us are going to be really, really involved in that research. I know some of you have reached out to me already, and we, we need to form that research core moving forward. So if I could just put my email up out there, it's tj, g-h-o-s-e, at gmail.com. If you could just send me an email, and I'm interested in doing some, you know, really active research, so that in two years we have some of these results. But it will take a little time. It's not going to be a research and a very slow process. Yeah, so I think we're moving forward on all of these arms, right? And so, uh, yeah, kind of. Kind of, and maybe we need to determine what's what's immediate or short term, and what's long term, and then say definitively who is responsible for what and who will be at the next meeting. Just a question: Did that uh, movie night uh, that's showing at the Occupy ever happen? Here, it happened here. It happened here. Ago. Yeah, um, but it was only it was about twenty people who came out. But we just kind of showed the film. I mean, it wasn't really, and that could be another thing we do, right? Like we could make our own freaking documentary right. about the day. Well, the one, of the things that, one of the things that we were talking about with the Astia group um, was because basically the curfew stopped the first and police brutality on one big ball that are kind of connected together, and so we were thinking about showing uh, a couple films. Uh, that would total it'd be a short film and then a, you know another short film or whatever uh, about some of the stuff that happened um, around the skia, around this curfew and so on. And maybe having just the night where we could show these films and hopefully uh, do it before this eviction date, so that people would understand in this discourse exactly what the Philadelphia Police Department is really all about um, and get some good footage uh, of them in living color uh, doing what they do best. <clears throat> so maybe that's what to be done. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I think we have a lot of solid stuff, right? So we have film screenings. We have we need a messaging group. I think is what we're talking about in terms of um, framing, and we need people to be in charge of each of these things. Danica and Osley are actually in charge of outreach um, and trying to try to like, kind of coalesce everybody and make sure everybody's reaching out and getting the message out. So um, if, you, if you're one of those people who's responsible for reaching out to whomever, if you could. Check with me before you leave, just so I can get your information and swap. Yeah, and then we also have people who might be interested in messaging, right? So really, kind of thinking how a proposal um, of what we should be naming ourselves should we name ourselves like, you know, Philly Advocates, Philly's Kid Advocates, or I don't know, I don't know what the, the name will be, but um, I think that's important because then we can kind of start coalescing with other groups under this like kind of idea. Um, is there anybody who's interested in messaging or doing working on that? Um, okay, so Vanessa, um, I don't know all of your names. Can you shout them out for me? Thomas. Thomas, uh huh. Vanessa. Who else? Savannah. Savannah. Roman. Roman. Okay, cool. Sachin. So 
that's messaging campus. Okay. Um, TJ is doing handling the community action research. If you guys are interested in that, we're really hoping to make it. I think theoretically three to all universities, ideally, but right now at least Drexel, Penn, and the Temple. Um, and so, if you guys know scholars in each of those pockets who might be interested in kind of, especially if they're early on, like first years, they might be really interested in kind of working on a community action project like this. Please um, let TJ know. And then what else do we have? So. Well, I was gonna say, what, what about like? There, like, um, what I had in mind when I said in terms of like uh, organizing uh, and building coalitions and then getting out to school, like I, I thought I had in mind like a group of people trying to you know just, just like work on going to, like, organizing meetings and school, like, talking to you know principals at schools, talking to different people at schools. Like, I don't know where I'll, I don't know if that's on the list yet. Um, okay. but yeah. that's something that we wanted to do. Yeah, I agree. I, I partly I bring up. I don't know if I wrote up here. I was thinking that maybe we could even at Penn, because a lot of some of us are Penn students, we could have a conference that we invite teachers to um, for field trips, theoretically, and so that they could legitimately take their kids out for a few hours maybe and, and do some stuff, which is different than what you're talking about. So maybe we have um, community engagement, I think is what you're talking about, which is different than it's on the actual education. Yeah, and education. Yeah. Do we have anybody who wants to work on the the, um, the materials? Somebody was saying that they were thinking about the materials? Savannah? Yeah. This is a quick announcement for anybody who doesn't know. I think there is a vote on the eviction today at GA. So we should let everybody know. Or just, is there's, there's, a, there's a week long discussion. Yeah, okay. It's not Friday. The vote got canceled. It's Friday, right? Friday. For various reasons. Uh, if they're giving the vote, it'll probably be Thursday. Right. If the state's a Friday. Well, if anybody has any like graphics or knows someone, maybe we can kind of hook up either on the Occupy Media website or some sort of interactive tool that people can have. Of, like, why should you care about the curfew? Um, maybe trying out some of the stuff that Vanessa. Oh, there's their paper, by the way. If you want a full length version of their uh, presentation as a paper, it's in the back available there. Um, but I think we have some solid stuff. So I probably won't, I don't know if you're going to convene next week for the curfew. And I hope we do. I wouldn't be here, but it's clearly in capable hands. Um, so thank you guys. I don't know if we Yeah, we should we use public hands now? Yeah. What time is it going to be? Wednesday. Tuesday? All right. Uh, I propose that we do next week at 6, but I don't want to go over. Maybe oh, we should have one day, though, that Pocupy meets with curfew. We should actually. Yeah, okay, so I'll propose next week at Occupy, Occupy. Yes. Occupy, Occupy? No, like Occupy, Occupy. Occupy is Philadelphia, Occupy. Uh, no, it's not the people of color. Oh, okay. Um, okay, well, let's, let's, let's just so everyone knows, also, next Monday, Tuesday night, we will have a chunk of people from OWS and DC here, and they want to be talking about this stuff, too, because of the stuff that's going on in New York. And because there's a crew of them marching down starting on Monday, I think Monday. So then it sounds Monday. like Tuesday is a good day um, to do it. So Monday or Tuesday, because they'll be stopping and staying in Philly for two nights, or one night, two days, something like that, um, on the way down to the city. Oh, okay, so we'll be going past each other. Okay, so so Tuesday, next week, the same time then. Does that work for everybody? If you could just, what is it, Wait, wait, are we we're yeah. meeting again Tuesday? Yeah, next okay. Tuesday. Here and there, people call it meeting. Well, I'm wondering if maybe we can come up with a way that maybe once a week we all come together. And, and or is there just a different day? Yeah, is that a day? Is there, like, Wednesday? Wednesday? Well, she was just suggesting that Tuesday to make connections with OWS. We'll talk about, we'll send out an email, basically. Okay. Is everybody here on the curfew list? No. no. Where is that list? Um, okay. If you know me and you want to, if you know my, you have my email address, um, then Email me and I'll, if I don't remember, um, I'll put you on the, I can put you up to 10 people a day on the curfew list. Um, so, and if you need my, I have a card too, so I can give that to you. If you're, if you're interested in being on the curfew list and getting the stuff going, we're going to try to keep meeting once a week at least, to so just keep initial, um, inertia going, but also maybe the sub meetings will keep kind of contacting people in other ways. So, okay. So we're gonna let you guys go. Thank you so much for coming out. And, um, anyway, outreach. Yeah, meeting building. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And as that is heading up direct action. Um, but if you're interested in doing curfew action, well, this is in the bag on the table. Does anybody mind taking breaking this down on a piece of paper? Thank you.